Thank you. How's everybody doing? Um, before I start, I just want to get a sense as to who's in the room so I can try to cater this a little bit more towards you. Um, so raise your hand if you're at Stern. Okay, raise your hand if you're an NYU undergrad. Okay, raise your hand if you're not in school. Okay, fuck. Um, raise your hand if you are actively raising money for a company right now. Okay, raise your hand if you have a company you're working on and not raising money. Okay, raise your hand if you're looking for a tech co-founder. Really? Okay. Raise your hand if you're a tech co-founder looking for somebody looking for you. <laughs> um, raise your hand if you don't know why you're here and you're just listening to me yap. Okay, cool. Um, so this probably works for the people who are raising money or have a company and might raise money. Uh, most of what I say is geared at fundraising. Most of what I say is transferable to customers and sales and general running your company shit. So sort of adopt adapt what I say to that, um, but it will skew more towards fundraising just because that's what I do. Um, so my name is David Tish. I'm the managing director of Techstars in New York City. Techstars is a seed stage accelerator program, which is basically a boot camp for startups. We take applications like a college. Um, we accept around 10 to 15 companies into our program. They get about $120,000, three and a half months of, of intense mentorship out of our office. Uh, in New York, we have about 150 New York City-based mentors who come in, work with our companies. Each mentor picks one company in our program to work with for three and a half months. Program ends on a demo day in front of about 500 investors, 750 people at Webster Hall. Uh, Techstars has been around for about five years. We started in Boulder, Colorado. We're also in Boston, Seattle, now in Texas and New York City. I joined about a year and a half ago to open and run our New York office. In New York, we've run two programs last year. We funded 23 companies. 21 of them went on to raise VC money. Over $55 million was raised within the past year by companies coming out of our program. Historically, Techstars has funded about 110 companies. 90% of those go on to raise venture capital money or reach profitability on their own, sort of achieve the goal that they set out to achieve. Nine out of the first 30 companies to go through our program have been acquired by companies like AOL, eBay, IAC, WordPress, and more. Um, we're very focused on mentorship. We believe that surrounding first time or entrepreneurs who are looking for advice with people who've done it before is the best model for success. We call it an accelerator because we genuinely believe that coming into our program will accelerate your startup. So we're stage agnostic, industry agnostic, and team agnostic. We don't care what you're doing or who you are. What we do is take a look at your team and decide if we can help you as a program. If we think we can help you, you're fit for our program. If you are building an energy saving hardware device, we're gonna be terrible at helping your company. If you're building something software related, whether it's B2C, B2B, it probably fits within what we do. Um, on the side of that, I'm an angel investor. I'm an angel investor in about 65 technology software companies. 45 or so based in New York City. Companies like GroupMe, Fab.com, Flavors.me, Skillshare, um, and a bunch of others. It's all through an entity called Box Group and available at the, the portfolio is at boxgroupnyc.com. Um, so today's talk is focused on email. Email is probably the single most important tool that an entrepreneur can be good at. Why? Because it's really easy and you can stand out from people who suck at email. The majority of entrepreneurs are pretty shitty at email. When they engage an investor, most of the people literally just do it horribly wrong. So you guys, as students, as entrepreneurs, if you figure out how to do email better than other people, you literally have a competitive advantage to raising money to acquiring customers. That's the point of this talk is at Techstars last year, I saw 6,000 companies reach out to me for funding. Whether that's through Techstars, we had about 3,500 applications, or as an angel investor, I probably looked at between 1,000 and 2,500 deals. Um, what I did is, is last year I took a look at all those communications, then I sent out a survey to about 40, uh, this slide deck is really pain in the ass to do, so it's gonna be a little slow. Um, sent out a survey to about 40 VCs who are high volume, high email VCs and said, what are your pet peeves? What do people do wrong? So what you'll hear tonight is a collection of those answers, plus my bias put into 
this deck, and ideally there's some concrete rules matched with some sort of common sense that I'll go through. Um, so the first thing is have common sense. It's really easy. You guys are at NYU, you're at NYU Business School, you guys are probably smart. Most of you guys are probably really smart. So using that as the first step to engage investors is the best tool. So sort of throw everything you do at common sense and say, is this the best thing for me to do? Um, stalk people. Today on the internet, stalking is encouraged. Why? Because we put shit out there for you to stalk. So if someone has a blog, if someone has a Twitter stream, if somebody has like Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, use that to your advantage. You have an information advantage if you consume it. If you're having a meeting with Fred Wilson and have not read literally not just his blog post from that day, but probably a year or two years worth of his blog, you're crazy. You're going in there with less information than he's put out there for you to consume. So consume it. Reading that stuff, you'll have a better ability to connect with him, to know where he's coming from. Fred has probably blogged everything that he's thought about over the past three years. So if you read it, you'll literally know how to attract him as an investor. Um, personalize, and so Fred and me are very different. We invest in different stuff, we have different check sizes, we come in at different stages. If you send me and Fred the same cold email, you're probably not going to get a response from either one of us. Yet, if you use all that information out there and customize your email to one of us, you're probably going to win. Um, and so use that to your advantage. I also don't know what's on my slides, so I'm going to look every time. Um, so NDAs suck. Nobody's going to sign them. That's what start from a position of trust means. Like, assume we're good actors. As an investor, the only thing I have to live by is my reputation. If I suck, people are going to talk about me. No one's going to take my money. So if you approach me from a position of not trusting me, I'm not going to trust you. We're never going to work together. Um, I don't know a single investor who would sign an NDA. So if you get an investor who will sign an NDA, you're probably talking to the wrong person. So investor relationships in general, the best way to engage an investor, the number one way to engage an investor is through a warm introduction. Finding somebody that they know and trust and having that person introduce you to the investor, you move way up the stack. The key to that sentence is someone they know and trust. If you get introduced by someone they don't know, don't like, or don't trust, you literally lose credibility. The person that brings you into that firm basically speaks for you. So understanding how close they are to that investor and genu genuinely understanding their relationship with that investor is super important. If somebody offers to blind introduce you to somebody, you should be very wary of that because it's probably gonna bite you in the ass and cause your company a disservice. Anybody who cold introduces somebody to me, I really, really don't respect. So it's called a two-way introduction. What does that mean? You ask that person for an introduction. They then send me an email. Hey, David, I got this really interesting deal. Deck's attached. Tell me if you're interested. If I then respond back, yes, please, and they make that introduction, you literally move way up my stack. If instead I get a cold email from some guy that says, hey, David, check out this company. They're CC'd. You should meet with them. I probably wait a week to respond to you just because. And so that's your way into an investor is through somebody warm. Um, next best way is send a cold email. There are better ways to send a cold email than normal. We'll go through those in a minute. Um, looking for an investment, the worst way to do it is through social media. Building a relationship, the best way to do it is through social media. There's a huge difference there. Building a relationship means commenting on someone's blog, showing them who you are, showing them good thought. Tweeting at Fred Wilson, hey Fred, I got a really cool startup. You should check it out. Can I send you a deck? Horrific. Like literally, that's not going to work. Um, and so use the social media to take advantage of showing off your thought, not in terms of how to communicate with people. Email is still probably the best way to get somebody's attention. You'd be surprised, but every single investor that I know responds to cold emails. If you send Fred Wilson, and I'll keep using Fred Wilson as an example, because he's sort of like a god in this town, and we'll just put him there and, and go with it. Um, but he responds to cold emails, Brad Feld responds to cold emails, Ron Conway responds to cold emails, as does Yuri Milner. And so no matter who they are in our industry, they respond to cold emails. So most people don't respond to cold like app messages or cold. Link LinkedIn is probably the worst way to engage an investor. Um, 
It will work once out of a thousand times, but it'll cost you 999 of them. Um, build relationships, show, don't tell. So if you have a demo, show it, don't talk about it. Um, over time, this is how you get an investment. In general, this is how you get an investment. In general, this is how you get a customer. Your job as an entrepreneur is to build a line for the person you are talking to. How do you build a line? By setting a series of dots in order. How do you set a series of dots? Every single interaction you have with an investor is a dot. They are going to put that dot on a graph. If those dots move up and to the right, you're doing well. If they move down and to the right, you're not doing well. Brad Feld phrases it very differently. He says, every single interaction with a company or an entrepreneur needs to be better than the previous interaction. If it's not, we're not going to do the deal. That means every email you have with Brad needs to be better than the previous one. Every interaction you have needs to be better than the previous one. Your job as an entrepreneur is to build a line. How do you do that? By showing progress. Progress in whatever it is you're doing. If it's progress in your thought, that's OK. It's progress in making your company. If it's progress in like traction, that's what you're supposed to show to build that, uh, build that line. Email. So I get on average between four and 800 emails a day. I respond to every single one of them. That's not very easy. Um, I stay up till probably 3, 4 AM every single night clearing my inbox. If I miss a day, I'm fucked. So literally, um, the best way to get to somebody with an inbox like that is to short, direct, and like very clear emails. I would say three, four sentences max is the goal. Um, hello, hey David, how are you doing? Doesn't necessarily count as a sentence. But the meat of your email should not be six paragraphs. I'll probably skim it, I'll pay attention somewhat to it, and I'll respond back quickly. You should not be dissuaded by a three-word response from somebody who has an inbox. They probably read your email, and they probably just fired back a genuine three-word response because they're going through their email clearing out four to 800 emails a day. Punctuation, capitalization, spelling, really trendy. Try it. Um, this is really, really weirdly important. So everything in life that you send to somebody should be searchable. What does that mean? The subject of your email should not be, hey, intro, startup, awesome social gaming thing. It should say your company name. Why? Because that's what I'm going to search for in my inbox after you send something. If I need to recall what you're doing, I'm going to type in either your company name or like the buzzwords that you use to describe it. So if you don't use that in your title, I'm probably not going to be able to find it when I go search. When you create a document for me, if it says presentation deck or investor deck or investor deck version two, I literally have no idea who you are. I need to then save it, rename your file. You've now created work for me. Instead, you know, company name, investor deck, company name, demo, and then the version or the date that you send it. Take advantage of really, really easy things to do. Makes my life much easier when I go to recall it, I find it, respond quickly. So Chris Dixon's a great example. I send Chris an email. He takes about two to three days to write back to me on average. I write back to that email within 30 seconds almost every time. Why? Because then we go back and forth and finish that transaction. So if I waited two to three days to respond to Chris, when I respond, I probably go right back into his two to three day stack, and then we're in a two to three day cycle. Instead, if I respond super quickly, we get it over with and are done, and everybody's happy, and that transaction through that email is done. Um, if I CC somebody on an email, I didn't do it by accident. So if you then respond to just me, and then I have to add back in that person, I think you missed the point. So pay attention to reply all. Most people in our industry understand email and don't get inundated with too much email. So over CC, don't under CC. Um, you can show email, you can show personality in email. I think this link down here is important, so I included it or something. Check it out. Um, don't ask open-ended questions. What do you think of this? How should I move forward next? Ask something really specific. If you're emailing somebody, like ask for something, something to find. What do you think of my customer acquisition strategy? Here's how I'm thinking about going to market. What do you think of that? What do you think of my UX? What do you think of this version? Get to the point. Um, 
If you're trying to schedule something, so if we do get to the point where I say, okay, let's have a meeting, what's the, I am available anytime, whenever you're, is convenient for you. If that's the case, I probably don't want to meet with you because you have no life and nothing going on in your schedule. Seriously. So if I emailed Fred, I'm available anytime, like, no, I'm not. I probably have shit to do. So you should be avail readily available, but not all the time. And you should present very clear slots as to when you're available. The worst slot to present is tomorrow morning. The best slot is probably a week out and laying out your week. So if you look here, this is a great way to lay out a potential meeting. You gave me literally like 17 different options for when I can meet with you. That's awesome. Saying, hey, David, I can meet with you Tuesday 11 to 12, Wednesday 2 to 3, Thursday 1 to 2. Like, fuck you. I'll just say no because that's annoying. Um, let me pick. Intros, two-way only. Provide relevant information. So as you're doing an intro, put context in there. Normally what context means, like how do I want an intro? If you ask me to intro you to Brad Feld, what I'll ask you to do is start a brand new fresh email. Why? Because then I don't have to delete all this shit behind our email that got us to that point. All I'm looking to do is hit forward, add Brad Feld to it, or reply all, add Brad Feld to it, see your email on the bottom, see your deck, see your demo, and type, hey Brad, would love to introduce you to so-and-so, you should check it out, see below for more info. That's super easy for me. Again, you're not creating work. Be available. It, after I intro you, move me to the BCC. Thanks, David. Move to BCC. Hey, Brad, really nice to connect. Would love to tell you more, blah, blah, blah. Have a purpose. If you ask me to introduce you to somebody and you have no reason for that introduction, I'm not going to introduce you. If you say, hey, I want to meet Fred because Fred's really cool and I read his blog, is that really worth my karma and my social capital to reach out to Fred to tell him that I want to introduce him to somebody who reads his blog? No. You better have a really good deal, otherwise I'm not going to shoot Fred an email because it's a waste of my social capital with Fred. I lose credibility if I send him a wasting, like a wasted time deal or a wasted time email, I look like an idiot. Um, so have a purpose and ideally stand out with that purpose so that I want to do that. Um, if you're asking for an intro, make sure you're asking for the right person. So we have a bunch of people in our other Techstars programs, and Techstars New York are the Foursquare guys are our mentors. So we have a company in Texas that emails me, hey, I really want to connect with the Foursquare guys. Can you introduce me to Dennis or Naveen? I write back, why? They write back, because we're using the same technical stack as they are, and I want to understand how they thought about it. No, I'm not introducing you to Dennis. A, that's not what he does. B, that's a wasted intro. C, who do you want to talk to there? Probably the CTO. Probably the person who made those decisions, not Dennis or Naveen. So you over asked, you screwed up the ask, and you picked the wrong person. Um, that's it. Cold emails. Um, how do you do this? Personalize them. That's the first thing. Like, go back to stalking. I gave you like 17 opening, e opening sentences for you to use. Hey, David, go Giants next week. Like, that's obvious. If you follow my Twitter, if like, you know anything about me, I like the Giants. It's a great opener. Or, hey, David, congratulations on finishing the Texas application process. I know you're super busy right now, but I wanted to get this in front of you. Awesome, you connected. Hey, David, I know you like investing in sports startups. I got one. You showed me that you did a little work. If you send me an email and I'm on BCC, or if you send me an email that's a copy and paste, I have this little cool program called Text Expander. And if I type in no way with two N's, a cold copy and paste response that says, no thanks, not interested in what you're doing, best of luck gets sent right back to you. It's super easy. I know how to copy and paste too. Um, so make an effort short. Uh, specific ask, not money or a meeting. Opening up your, hey, David, would love to connect. We're raising money. Here's our valuation. Are you interested? Nope, I'm not. I have no idea who you are. Like, build that line. There's no line if you open up a cold email by asking me for money. Build a relationship. Um, optimize the send time. Who thinks they know when is the best time to send an email? Raise your hand to an investor. Yes, go. No, probably not. What day of the week? Yell. Tuesday. No. Thursday, no. Sunday. Yes. Why? Because it's the most rude time ever. Seriously. Every single investor at the end of like Sunday night, 7, 8 o'clock, probably sits down for that week and tries to clear their inbox. So they go into the week with no email. If you send an email to an investor at like 6, 7, 5 o'clock on a Sunday, it's probably going to be at the very top of their email as they go to sit down to do their email for the week. Is it rude? Sure. But you're going to get right to the top of their inbox. The worst days to send it, Monday, 
which is when all VCs have partner meetings because they're busy and doing that. Fridays are going into a weekend. Saturday's stupid. Tuesday, probably the second best day because they've dealt with Monday, they're into their week and there's some flow. I like to send them on Sundays. Um, this is a really shitty Facebook message that was sent to me once. That's what it ended with, his cell phone number. So I'm supposed to just call him up, hey man, thanks for the Facebook message, what's going on? If you do get to a phone call, here are some rules about phone calls. Understand the difference in mediums. When you get on the phone, you have a really, really good opportunity to show a couple things. Energy. So if you get on the phone with me and you're really quiet and it's hard to talk to you, I think you're a terrible entrepreneur because it's hard to talk to you. And why would I invest in you if it's hard to talk to you? Show energy, get me excited, show passion. You probably can't show that much passion on an email. You can show a ton of passion on the phone. Bring that out. Some people hate phone calls like me. So if you ask me for a phone call, it is literally like something I totally dread. I'd rather email with you or meet with you. So if I say, hey, I'm much better at email, let's stick with that. Don't say, no, I really need a phone call. Now you piss me off and I don't wanna do a phone call and I dread them and it's like really annoying. Um, some people love phone calls, so just figure that out. People will tell you, investors normally are honest with you until they say no to your deal, at which point they switch to dishonest and give you some bullshit reason why. We'll get to that later. Um, but in general, they'll be pretty forward with their habits. Again, like a bunch of the good investors lay this stuff out on a blog. Like Fred lays out how to reach Fred Wilson on like six different blog posts. Read them. Um, so use each thing to your advantage. Do a call from a quiet place, not like the streets of New York City. That's stupid. Um, if you sent me something, assume I read it. Understand the time that you have on the phone. I would, if you don't know how long you have, open up with, hey, I just wanted to check, how long do you have to talk to me? The person will respond back, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. You as the person calling should know exactly how you are going to use that time period. You should in your head have slotted the 15 minutes, two minutes of an intro, five minutes of a describe what I'm doing in my vision, five minutes of sort of back and forth Q&A on strategy, and two minutes on what we're gonna do next to follow up. Really go in and have that phone call structured so that you get what you want out of it. Respect the time. If he told you 15 minutes, when it gets to minute 14, hey, I know you gotta jump in a minute, last question. That's like the nicest thing you can do because it shows me you respected what I said, respected my time, and utilized the time well. Um, don't get me on the phone and go through a 10 minute dissertation on what you're doing. Why? Because I'm gonna hit mute and then I'm gonna go back to my email. And you're gonna keep talking. When I hear you pause, I'm gonna hit on mute and say, cool, that's awesome. How can I help? And I literally have no idea what you probably said. Um, so the best way to get around that and, uh, and cheat or trick me is start talking and within the first minute or the second minute of you talking, ask me a question. I probably have muted you, I probably stopped listening. Second you ask me a question, I'm like, oh shit, I gotta pay attention. Because if you ask another question, I'm gonna get lost. And so you literally get me to engage by asking me a question right after you start talking. Um, be respectful of time. Don't set this stage, like get to the meat. Or like, I understand that mobile's trendy. I understand that like social's big. I understand the basics of the web, that's why I do this. So you spending five minutes telling me that like, the trend is that Facebook's opening up is like a stupid waste of time. Meetings. I'm trying to run through this so we can open it up with questions. So I'm talking really fast. Um, like handshakes, eye contact, awesome. Really, really good. Uh, if you're in a coffee shop, don't go sit in the back with your laptop and be heads down when I walk in. Like stand in front and wave. Go look at my picture online and know who I am so when I walk into a coffee shop to meet you, you look at me and go, hey David. Then I don't have to walk around and go, hey are you Matt? Hey are you Matt? It's like, then by the time I find Matt, I'm like, this sucks. Um, if you ask for a meeting, I have a purpose. If you need to set shit up, get there early. I get that there are subways and cabs and weather and traffic. I had to deal with the same shit and I got there. Get there early. Like, don't show up at the exact moment and then need five minutes to set up. That's five minutes less of meeting. Show up and be ready to go. It shows that you're professional. Um, you assume people were prepared, send stuff in advance, and if somebody didn't read it, like, take that as an indicator that they might not be the investor for you. 
Like, if you send shit, assume that somebody read it. Now, I might have read it the night before, and I might need to recall a couple things, but assume that I read it. Manage the time, same thing as before. Sell me by being good, not by selling me. Show me something awesome. Walk me through your thought process. Talk to me about your thesis on a really crowded space and why you're different. Don't just sell me. I can tell somebody who's selling me on bullshit right away. Be authentic. Um, understand me. Like, understand that I write 50K checks, I'm normally early on, and that I don't lead a deal. If you come to me expecting me to lead a deal or, like, invest in your $20 million valuation Series B deal, like, that's not what I do. So you've wasted your time and mine. Um, so features, features in general. In your startup, features are not a differentiator. Features are probably not why you're going to beat your competitor. Features are not why your product's interesting. The benefits of those features are, we built this and did it this way because users now get or can do X. Walk me through the benefit analysis, not walk me through a list of things that you decided to include in your product. Why is much better than what? Um, an hour meeting, the first time, is like almost a 0% shot. If you worked at Google like for seven years and built Google Maps, I'll probably sit with you for an hour. If you sold three companies before, I'll sit with you. If you're like a random cold email that I decide to meet, 20 minutes. That's awesome. Maybe 30. But anything beyond that, wrong. Um, ask a lot of questions. Your goal is not to sell me. It's to sort of, you asking the right questions, you asking interesting questions, I'm more intrigued by you than if you try to just talk at me for that 20 to 30 minutes. Social media, blogging is good. Every company should have a blog. It doesn't mean that your blog is going to be the OkCupid blog or the Mint blog, but every company should have a blog. Why? Because as an investor, I can understand how you think, how you make progress, how you communicate to the world. As an entrepreneur, you're going to need to sell your company to customers, to like users, to investors, to somebody who's going to buy your company one day. Showing me that you're an effective communicator through your blog is a really powerful way. Don't mix personal and business. If you do that, you better be amazingly good at it. Dennis Crowley, his personality lives within Foursquare. So those merge. If you're a B2B enterprise solution and you happen to be a 25-year-old kid or a person, mixing personal and business, bad idea. Why? Because your business needs to look professional and uber serious and uber sort of trustworthy. You're Drinking, or you going out, or your four square check ins, or anything like that on your blog, stupid. Make it about your industry. Um, careful with friending. The worst thing any of you guys could do is after this, go LinkedIn request me. Hey, David, really good meeting you at your talk tonight. Okay, awesome. I'll hit accept or decline. If I hit accept, you probably are in a bad position. Because when you go to raise money from Fred Wilson, he's going to go look up your LinkedIn and see you're connected with me. Then he's going to shoot me an email. What do you think of Phoebe? I have no idea who Phoebe is. Shit. So then Fred Wilson is going to say, OK, everybody else they're connected with on LinkedIn is probably not somebody they know. And so then your references, even if they're real, collapse on their face. Every single person that you are connected with on a social media site, you should be comfortable with referring you and talking about you. Otherwise, you are going to get that response. We do a lot of homework via the back channel to check on you before we engage with you. Understand that. Uh, I would go defriend everybody on LinkedIn that you really don't know after this. That's my advice, especially me. If you don't know me, go unfriend me. Um, be early on new stuff. So if you were super early on Turntable, you were literally sitting there with like 150. If you're like first 300 user on Turntable, you're literally sitting there with 150 of the most powerful people in the tech industry. So you could sit in that chat room and talk about music, but you're somehow now on their radar. So if you're early on new shit or if you stand out on new, so, on new like platforms, you build a name for yourself. So the people who are early on Twitter, the people who are early like at being great on Google+, now have risen to the top of this random new pedestal that just got created. You have an ability to take advantage of new products. It also shows that you're like an experimenter, especially if you're doing consumer stuff. If you are building a consumer app and you're not trying everything out there, you're crazy. Crazy. 
Um, if you're building something that's better than Twitter and you're like, I don't use Twitter, <laughs> like, come on. Um, if you're building like a social photo thing and you're like, yeah, Instagram sucks because of this feature is not there. Oh, I bet Instagram didn't think of a, having a product roadmap. I bet they're not going to release new stuff. Um, you don't differentiate on features, but you should differentiate. So if you're tweeting, like, be awesome at it. Don't be mediocre at it. If you're blogging, be awesome at it. Whatever you do, be great at it. If, you're, if you stand out doing something little, I'm going to assume you can stand out doing something big. If you can't stand out doing something little, if you can't differentiate yourself, I assume you're not going to be able to do that in your business. So every single indication that you put out there to the market, you should be awesome at. Twitter, personal versus company. Every company should have a Twitter account. Even if you don't like use it all that often, people are going to Google you. If you don't have a Twitter account, they're going to wonder why. Um, like there should, they just should exist. Your tweets are public. Think about your most serious and real and most important customer reading every single one of your tweets. So if you tweet something about being blackout drunk that weekend on your personal account, Take a step back and imagine that the most serious person in your business's life is reading that tweet. Is that something you want out there? I tweet a ton of dumb shit. Like a ton. If you follow my Twitter, it's really annoying and noisy. I'm okay. I assume that the most serious people that I deal with read my dumb and noisy shit. I'm comfortable with that. If you are comfortable with it, that's fine. But if you're, again, B2B enterprise stuff and you're tweeting about like partying, you're probably making a huge mistake. Don't be inflammatory. It just doesn't help. If you go cause a fight or if you go talk shit on people or things on Twitter, I assume that you're an inflammatory person and going to sort of cause conflict at numerous points in your business's life cycle. Basically, as an investor, you extrapolate every dot. And if I can extrapolate that dot up and to the right, awesome. I create that line. If it moves down and to the left or down and to the right, you guys are screwed. Materials. So what are the best materials to have at all moments of your business? You should always, no matter what, even if you're not raising money, have these documents ready to go. Three of them. One is a one-pager. This is not a one-page Word document with no margins filled with text. This is a dynamic one-page description of your business. It should not have a ton of text. I'd say like three, four paragraphs worth of text with a image or two of what you do, and then a background on your team. That's an awesome one pager. A deck, six to 12 slides, probably the most you need. If you're doing something super technical or super theory driven, having an appendix explaining those things, awesome. Having a 25 or 35 slide deck, seriously silly. Assume that whatever you send should be able to be consumed in two minutes. If I consume it in that two minutes and I'm interested in learning more, you will know that. If I consume it in two minutes and I'm not, who cares if you have 13 more minutes left on the back end of that? That's silly. Um, format. Always send a PDF. Why? I can't edit it. I can't change it. I might not have Word. I might not have PowerPoint. I might not have Keynote. Everybody can open a PDF. Always send a PDF. Uh, sloppiness, first impressions are important windows, intro to you as a founder, blah, blah, blah. Um, send everything in advance. There's almost nobody who needs to show me things in person or walk me through your deck. If you're like some super secret amazing engineer, I'll believe you because you're a little paranoid and a little crazy and that's fine. Otherwise, like, unlikely that I really am going to wait for a meeting to see what you're doing because maybe I'm totally disinterested in what you're doing. Why do we need to have a meeting to determine that? We could have figured that out beforehand. So get me what I need to do to tell you if I'm interested and if it's worth our time. Maybe you're doing something that I have no idea and can't help you and I'm not interested in. That's a waste of your time. You probably wasted an hour of your day to talk to me about nothing. Brevity is your friend, two minutes. Uh, best compliment to those three documents, a product. That's the best thing that you can show. Excuse me for one minute. He knows that I'm doing a talk, and if he's texting me, there's a problem. Sorry, I'll keep yapping. Um, don't bury the lead. So if you have, um, um, okay. somebody random just showed up at our office, and 
my friend, my coworker is really scared and doesn't know who he is. Um, <laughs> we get stalkers at Techstars. It's the worst way to get into our program is to show up at our office. We had three of them today, I swear to God. Um, it's like bafflingly weird. Is David around? Is he around to meet with me? I just thought I'd stop by to see. No, I'm not. Um, don't bury the lead. So if you have like tons of traction, putting that in slide 11, stupid. Put it in slide one. Why? Because I'm going to pay attention to the next 10 slides a lot more. If you are, you know, the inventor of the Google AdSense algorithm, burying that in the back, stupid. Put the team slide up front so I believe that your team. So whatever your strength is, put that up front in your deck and lead with it so that I take the rest more seriously because you put that piece of evidence up front that I should. Um, Everybody understands the general market. So I understand mobile, I understand social. Diving into like e-commerce is a $400 billion business. Are you gonna own e-commerce? If not, don't tell me that. Tell me what you're gonna own and walk me through your market, your addressable market. You can say the big market is this, but my addressable market is this, and this is how I define it, that's fine. Address competition. If I know a competitor that you didn't mention, I don't think that you're right. I don't think that you know your space. I think you're trying to hide something from me. If you are building a consumer-facing app, a consumer-facing mobile app, et cetera, and you do not mention Google, Twitter, Facebook, or the big companies that are potentially in your space and address why they matter, why they don't matter, where you think they're going. If you don't have an opinion on Google, Facebook, Twitter, and you're building a consumer-facing app, you're crazy. Lay that shit out. <sighs> Random things. Never send calendar invites. How many people send calendar invites? Don't lie. Come on. Liars. Um, why, not, why do you not send a calendar invite? Because I can't edit it. So I actually have six different calendars that I use at all times. Like, so I use six different calendars. I keep everything on one calendar, but because I have all these email addresses, they all sync to stupid calendars. So everything, everything I do, I move to this one calendar. If you send me a calendar invite, I can't move it. Nor can I add details, nor can I add the location. So I'm dependent upon your calendar invite to sit in my calendar. I delete them all. And then I get an email. Hey, David, I just wanted to confirm that we have this meeting. I just sent you a calendar invite and you didn't accept it. Now I have an extra email because of your silly calendar invite. It like literally adds work. Let me do my own calendar. I'm really good at it. Send thank you notes, really super helpful. When you see me at a conference, so we had a nice woman who wanted to talk to me before this. Um, as I walked up here, she goes, hey David, right? And I'm like, yes. She goes, can I have two minutes of your time? I'm like, okay. She goes, um, Adriana, I, I emailed you three weeks ago. Okay. Um, I'm busy tonight, but I'd like to talk to you now. Okay. No, I have no idea who she is. I have no idea what she wants. Like that was the worst cold opener ever. Are you here? Because if you are, you stunk out there. No, good, you're busy. Um, so, so, yeah, she didn't make it. Um, I probably know who you are. So if you walk up to me or you met me at a conference and then you run into me, hey David, we spoke for two minutes at the end of your talk at Internet Week last year. Okay, now I have some context. Hey David, my name's John, we talked last year, I'm working on this social discovery app. Awesome, you gave me some context, I know who you are. Within that opening sentence, I can talk to you with some ability to at least pretend that I remember you. Instead, hey David, it's been so long since I've seen you. The rest of the time you're talking, I'm thinking, who is this? Oh man, who is this? I gotta figure it. So I'm literally not listening to you. I have no idea who you are and I have no idea how to listen. Hustle, differentiate, hustle. Like you can outsmart everybody, but if you out hustle people and outsmart them, you're gonna win. Um, Learn from everybody. So Group Me gives credit to Eric Paley from Founder Collective for figuring out how they should build their business. Eric was the first investor that said no to Group Me. Eric laid out all these reasons why he said no. So normally I say yes and then you have to go out and get the other investors. A, I will help you. B, if I don't hear from you for eight weeks, I'm done, I'm out of the deal. So if I've said yes, I'm interested in giving you my money, keep me updated. I'm rooting for you to finish that round. Why? Because I want to invest. So use me, keep me informed, keep me excited. If you don't do that, I will lose interest in your deal. We have a deal that we committed to in October. They still have not raised all their money. They send me an email every six weeks saying, hey, we're still trying to finish this up. I'm done. No 
chance I'm doing that deal anymore. Took them five months. They've not asked for my help. They've not followed up. They've not kept me excited. Like they lost their momentum. So if somebody is interested in what you're doing, keep them updated. I would engage investors well before you want to raise money. Why? Because then you build that line. And by the time you want money, you might have built that line to the point where they're offering you money. Or if you're awesome, you have built that line to the point where they come to you and say, hey, can I give you money? And you're like, okay. Um, and so you, again, you're putting it on, the onus on them as an investor to reach out to you because they're so worried about this awesome line that they seem forming that they lose that deal that they reach out to you. Um, Know your investors. Some of them are going to add value. Some of them are going to not add value. That's OK. Understand what their role in your deal is. Understand, I have 65 deals. Do I sit down with all of them every day? No. So as an, investor, as an investment of mine, you should understand what role I play. And I will happily answer that for you and walk you through exactly what you should expect from me, exactly how much time you should expect. And if you're not comfortable with that as a value add to your company, you should not take my money. You should do that with every investor. After I say yes, give me everything I can do to sell your company. So give me this awesome email that I can hit forward and send it to as many people as I want because it has your deck, your demo, all the links, a demo account, whatever it is that equips me with the best tools to sell your company to somebody else that I want to talk to about it. Um, as you send information, give me numbers. If you don't give me numbers, I assume that your numbers aren't great. So if you say, yeah, traction's really good, we're moving forward, I'm like, ah, not that great. If you say, we've doubled up, we went from X to X, I'm like, okay, I get what you're doing. Um, I think this is it, hiring help. You as a CEO are in charge of finding people to work for you. That is probably the most important task that you as a CEO can do. There is no investor out there today that has a pipeline of Ruby on Rails developers to hand you as a company. We don't know Ruby developers who want to work for you, I promise. None of us do. If we did, we'd be much, much, much better at being investors than we all are today. Um, it just doesn't exist. In a down market it might, but not in this frothy market. Um, no one will hire for you. The best time to use your investors to hire are for senior level people. If you are growing and you need a VP of X, we can do that. If you're growing and you need a head of PR or some senior level person with a specialty, with an industry expertise, with like a background in what you're doing, we can find those people for you. We cannot find, and it's not a good idea to ask us to find junior people who are just filling slots in your company. Why? Because it's not a differentiator for you and that's your job and that's what I expect you as an entrepreneur to be able to do. The number one skill that a CEO can have is building a great team, period. Differentiate. How many people know how Hipster launched their hiring campaign about eight months ago? No one. So Hipster is a company in LA. They have a great domain name. So they took advantage of it. They put out a blog post and a, a sort of landing page that said, Hipster is hiring. If you refer a hire to us, we're hiring X like types of people as devs and something else, designers, I think. If you refer somebody to us and we hire them, we'll give you 10,000 bucks. And we'll give you a year's worth of PBR, a pair of skinny jeans, this really hipster bike, and like, like a fake beard. That's fucking awesome. So they got tweeted somewhere around like 300,000 times. They had 660 qualified refer, uh, references to developers. 660 leads. So what did they do with them? They, they looked at them all. They ended up interviewing like 30 people. And then they sold the leads to other companies. That $10,000 prize made them $200,000 in revenue. Well worth it. And they hired six people. That was differentiating. If you go and repeat what Hipster did, you're not going to hire anybody. But if you figure out some really creative way to hire, you're going to stand out and get 660 resumes referred to you by awesome people. That is the end of everything I have to say. Um, I'm good at email. That's how to email me. That's how to follow me on Twitter. Um, basically, goal now, I think we have plenty of time, and I'm happy to stay here till after. 
open it up. Any questions you guys have, ideally not about your specific startup, not about like your specific instance, but general stuff like fire away, anything at all that I've talked about, anything I do, happy to answer questions until there are no more. Yes, sir. Anything that I don't have to download is awesome. If I have to download it, something where I don't have to sign up or log in. Um, I, again, it's just removing barriers. So the goal is assume that people are processing their email box or whatever you sent in a chunk of time. Uh, so the, the oh, I can't do it here. I think I can. Maybe. Yeah, I'll show you what my inbox looks like. Not everybody does it this way, but everybody does it some way like this. Um, if they have a system, whether it's priority inbox or anything like that. Um, you should know your passwords. I think that was my password. Boom. OK. So you'll notice this. This is normal over here. This is normal. This is not normal. This is called multi-inbox. So what I do, you see red stars. Some of, right below red stars are red things. And then here's yellow, and here's blue, and here's green. OK? So what does all that stuff mean? As you come in my inbox, you'll see I only have 20 things in my inbox. I process my inbox in real time, at all times. What do I do? I look in my inbox and I reply to everything I can right off the bat because it's gone. Anything that I can't do at that moment, I move to the right. If you're super important, I move you to the red star. If you're not that important, I move you to the yellow star. If I have no idea who you are, you move to the blue star. I look at my red stars every day and clear that every day. I look at my yellow stars twice a week and I clear that twice a week. I look at my blue stars once every week or every other week and I clear that once every week or every other week. You don't want to end up as a blue star. If you give me a lot of work, you will end up as a blue star and I might not get to you for two weeks. So giving me really short, actionable things that I can reply to right away, that's the best way to get my attention. So anything that involves me having to sign up, do work, blah, 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 moves over to the right. So you don't want to end up in the right. Or you don't want me to go through, like every investor I know goes through their inbox, and if they can reply right away, they do it, because then it gets out of there. If they have to do any work, it sits in their inbox. Sometimes people like Fred declares email bankruptcy a couple times a year. If you're created work for him, you're going to end up in the email bankruptcy pocket. If you didn't, you're going to get a reply. And so that's where you want to end up. Next. Yes, ma'am. Uh, really yeah. Um, Never raise more than $250,000 from friends and family. Investors like friends and family investors. Why? Because people who've known you since you were this big believe in you enough to give you their money. That's an indication that you're not crazy because you can convince people who know you to give you money. I would never, ever, ever take money from friends and family who can't afford to lose that money. If your friends and family cannot afford to give you $10,000, do not take their $10,000. If they care about your $10,000, don't take it from them. Why? You've now put your relationship at risk. Your relationship went from friends and family to professional investors. Um, if they've never done it before, it's tricky. You're going to have to overcome that barrier. It's probably ad hoc. Um, if they've done it before, they'll figure it out. One of the better ways to do it is to get a professional involved in what you're doing. That will indicate to your friends and family that somebody outside of your loved ones believes in you too, so it goes back and forth that way. Um, there's no magic. I would probably, if I'm raising money from friends and family, ask once, and if they don't say yes, move on. 
because it's not something that I would compromise my friendships for. Um, but look, if you're desperate and you really are willing to throw a friend away trying to get their money, go for it. Yeah, so, oh, the thing I didn't mention is if you are raising money actively, you should also have some form of a financial document, so a pro forma. Um, I don't really look at them outside of looking at them for one second. What am I looking for in a financial, like, document that you send me that you're not fucking crazy? That's it. So your assumptions are not crazy. Your costs are not crazy. You understand the drivers of your business. You understand what the cost might be. If you don't understand those, so I got a deal the other day. Sean Green, the ex-Toronto Blue Jay baseball player, sent me his new tech startup, which as a Sean Green fan, I'm like, yes, I want to invest in Sean Green. I literally looked at his cap table and they were burning off, they, sorry, their revenue year one was three and a half million dollars. They had seven million users and their costs were $11 million, but they were only raising a million and a half dollars. I wrote Sean Green a note back and said, Sean, I have to pass. That was like the only time I think I've ever used numbers as the reason why I had to pass. And I wrote him a note and said, this is what's wrong with your numbers. And then he never replied. And now me and Sean Green are not going to work together. Um, but just show common sense in your financials. Nobody believes, especially consumer stuff. If you're doing like a niche enterprise sales thing, like understanding your market, and understanding the drivers in it, really important. If you're doing something consumer facing, I don't believe your user numbers. I don't believe your revenue. I don't believe your traction. I just want to see you're not crazy. I'm not judging your numbers. Um, deck, six to 12 slides. So here's what you should include in, and the order you should include it, if your team's amazing, your team should be the first slide. If your team's not amazing, it should be towards the back. Um, like if you've never done anything, put it in the back because it's not your differentiator. Who you are, what you're doing, try to include why you're doing it, where you are at in your process, some market slide, and the product. I don't think I forgot anything. Anybody think I forgot anything? Uh, market, yeah, want, like that's your market. What market you're going to, how big is it, who's in it, how you're going to win, what your differentiators are. Probably, so 12 deck slide, one on who you are, two on what you're doing and why, one on where you're at, your sort of traction, your stage, one on where you're going, like the roadmap, future roadmap, and that's probably what you're going to use my money for if there's a money slide involved. Um, and that could be combined in there, what your ask is. Um, two on market, competition, et cetera. Um, and then two to four on product. Show me your product. Show me, not your features, not your login screen, but like the core, like the two slot, two screens that I care about. So if it's a e-commerce site, show me like the general product page with multiple products and then show me the one product page. Those are probably the two things. Showing me your landing page, like showing off your launch rock page. Awesome, good job, you made a launch rock page. It's not your startup. So that, has, David, really excited, we just launched our landing page. Okay, congrats. Like, really, is that like what, what am I supposed to react? Show me something. I'll look at wireframes, I'll look at like a broken ass alpha, I'll, play with technology before it has a single bit of CSS or any skin on it. I don't care. Um, show me a product. Any stage. I've seen it all. Lower. Cool. Um, cool. Um, yeah, I think every everybody's different. Um, 
I like I, I want deep relationships. The the founders I like the least are ones that met at Startup Weekend or Lean Startup Machine or Craigslist. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, but the odds of you guys not getting along are much higher than the odds of people who've known each other since middle school not getting along. Um, that's up to you to risk that friendship, which you are risking if you go into business. I started my first company with two friends. Um, I shut it down when I realized that we weren't gonna get along. Um, and so I decided to save our friendship instead of moving forward with our business. We're still friends, our business didn't work. Um, like I was happy with that decision. I was 25 and I made a mature decision and I look back on that and it was a good decision because I genuinely like this person and I don't want to lose him as a friend and we were going down that path. But like there are other situations. Uh, Mike Lazaro from Buddy Media has built four companies with his wife. They get along, they're not divorced. Um, like every, every situation is totally different. Knowing your, like if you meet at a lean startup machine, the best thing I would do is go on like a month vacation with that person. Literally, like, go move in together. Or, like, go on a month. Hey, David, we just flew to Brazil and traveled around Brazil for a month together. I believe that you've developed some sort of, like, intense bond that now is actually a little bit more substantial than you meeting at a meetup or something like that. Um, so really figure out that depth. The other thing I'll say about that in co-founders, if there are, like, two business co-founders, again, like, again, it all depends. My favorite sort of thing, David Lee and Chris Dixon have written a lot about this product founder fit. So you've heard a lot about product market fit. Product founder fit. Is this the right team to be doing this idea? Is this the right team to disrupt this industry? That's super important. Is this the right team makeup to do this product? If you are a consumer facing app and you are four business co-founders and one tech co-founder, you're probably not right. If you are four business co-founders and one uh, tech co-founder and you're doing something that's a BD heavy, disrupt an industry, like reinvent a market, that might be the right dynamic. Um, the right team to me in a consumer facing app that's not super, super, super hard to build is one business co-founder, one product design co-founder, and one technical co-founder. I understand each of your roles very clearly. If you are two business co-founders, I want to understand how you're different. Whose role is what? Otherwise, I believe one of you is unnecessary. I also want to understand why the person who's CEO is CEO. I, today, asked a startup, Two business co-founders, a marketing co-founder, so three, a technical co-founder and whatnot. I looked at the non-CEO business founder and I said, why is he CEO? And I looked at the other guy who's CEO and I said, why isn't he CEO? You should be able to answer those questions. You should have those tough conversations as a team and flush that out and it shouldn't make you uncomfortable. My goal was to make them uncomfortable. Why? Because if I can make them uncomfortable, I assume their team is going to collapse. Startups are too hard that if that question makes your team uncomfortable, I assume that you guys haven't had open conversations, I assume you don't trust each other, I assume there's some awkward tension and your team's gonna collapse. Jared and Steve don't have that issue. The other thing that I would pay attention to is founders interrupting each other. Why? Because then you have a power struggle. Why? Because then you don't trust each other to be able to answer questions. Why? Because you disagree openly about like way too much basic shit. So I will watch two co-founders interrupt each other and I will say, okay, there's a power struggle and I'll move on because I assume that team's going to collapse. Pattern recognition tells me because we funded a couple companies where we saw that those teams have fallen apart or had real trouble. Pattern recognition tells me that if founders interrupt each other, that is a sign that they are having an internal issue. And I'll push them to interrupt each other. I want to see in a 30-minute meeting some shit go down. I do. I want to pull and push every, ask her. She met with me for 30 minutes. Yeah, no, it's true. Absolutely. We didn't ask easy questions. We pushed you to fight with your co-founder. We pushed you to disagree. You guys interrupted each other a lot. It was adorable. I liked it. <laughs> Let's say I do a panel or after this talk tonight and all you guys bull rush me. That is the single least enjoyable thing of being on a panel. That is the single least enjoyable thing about doing a talk. Why? Because 50% of you suck at this. The other 50% are fine. How would I approach that? I would walk up to the person, if you feel the utter need to get on my radar at this meeting tonight, um, 
By the way, I've literally looked around this room, and ideally, I can recognize any one of your faces. So if later on you tell me you were here, I'll recognize you. I have that weird ability to do that. Um, and I take like, I appreciate every single person here coming out to listen to my dumbass talk. So I literally want to help all of you. That's the goal of me being here. But at the end of the day, I can't sit here for two hours and do an assembly line. So if you do decide to approach someone after a panel, understand that they hate it. Understand that they don't want to talk to you. And so go in with that understanding. Hey, David, my name's Phoebe. Really appreciated what you wanted to say. I'm working on this really cool thing. Just wanted to say hello and get on your radar. Do you mind if I shoot you an email telling you about it afterwards? Phoebe, it's awesome meeting you. Thank you for respecting my time. I really look forward to your email. Awesome, awesome, awesome win. Instead, you come up here. And I'll use you. Hey, David, I got this social gaming app. I want to tell you about it. So what we did is we took this feature, and then we built this. You're pitching me, dude? Stop pitching me. Don't pitch me on your startup at the end of a panel. I'm trying to leave. I see this line of people. I'm looking. OK, let's get this guy out of here. Let's, I don't want to hear about your startup. It's the worst time to sell me on your startup. The worst time. The great time to get on my radar. That answer that, I think. Yes, sir. Go. You do the first part, and I'll tell you if it was good enough to get to the second part. <laughs> How many what? So Techstars, we fund between 10 and 15 companies per batch. As an angel investor, I averaged about a, a deal every 10 days in 2011. So I did I had 38 new deals in 2011, um, and I did 51 deals in 13 follow-ons. So I do about a deal a week if you include the follow-ons. Part two. That was an okay question. So part two. What's the success rate of the new company in the second round? Um, Techstars, historically, you know, 90% of our companies get funded after our program. Um, as an angel, most of my companies, are, or a lot of them, are too new to have follow-ons. Uh, of the ones 2000, before 2011, um, 22 out of 23 were followed on to. <laughs> Next. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, yeah, if you are, if you're a first-time entrepreneur, you probably need a product to raise money. Um, I've never seen you build anything. You have nothing in your past that shows me you've built stuff. If you've built stuff in your past, you might not need a product to go raise money. Why? Because you show your background and show that you can build stuff. Um, at Techstars, the earliest companies we take are the ones with the best background. If you are a first-time entrepreneur applying to Techstars and have never built anything, you have to have a product live. Otherwise, we literally cannot believe that you can build something. There is no evidence that says you can build something. So if you've never done anything in your past, yet if you're an engineer and you worked at Amazon and built the recommendation system, or you built Amazon Web Services and you're leaving there to go raise money, I believe you can build. And I'm going to go vet you from Amazon, but I'll believe that you can build. Um, does that answer that? So. Um, you know, you can raise money at any point. You can try to raise money. As an entrepreneur, I would raise money as late as I can raise money. I would bootstrap as long as I can. I would make as much progress as I can. Why? Because I will get a better valuation. I will get better investors. Mark Pincus from Zanga did not raise money until he was profitable. Why? Because he could raise it a crazy valuation. He could say, I don't need money. When you don't need money, you can get money at a very good price. When you need money, people will know you need money and not give you a good deal. The best way to get a better valuation is to get competing term sheets. The worst way to get a value, better valuation is to ask for one. As an investor, I have no incentive to move my valuation unless you force me to move my valuation. One of the ways to do that is to say, no, I'm not taking your deal. Then I take a step back and say, OK, do I want to pay more for that or not? The other best way to get a better valuation is to have a competing term sheet. David, we're actually looking at this other term sheet. It's a million dollars more. I'd love to work with you, but I just I got to take the money. That's crazy. That's a crazy expectation. So if I raise a $100 million fund 
and I invest a million dollars into your company to buy 20% of your company, you have to have a massive exit in order for me to pay back $100 million to my fund. I don't believe that you as a single person can build a company that size. So realistically, venture-backed businesses that are one person, unlikely. So you probably aren't a venture-backed business if you want to work alone forever. Um, you're a lifestyle business. Lifestyle business has a bad, like it has a bad connotation to that word, but it's awesome. If you can build a business that pays for your lifestyle and you're happy with your lifestyle, fuck, you won. You own 100% of your business. You have all the money that's coming to it and it's paying for your lifestyle. That's a really good thing. So when somebody says, I think it's a lifestyle business, that's not mean. That means it's good if you make it a lifestyle business. That said, I don't want to fund a lifestyle business. I am looking for massive growth. I'm looking for explosive growth. The number one indicator of a good entrepreneur is the ability to get other people excited about what you're doing. That's investors, but more importantly, that's team members. If you can convince somebody to leave another job to work with you, that's a great point of evidence. If you can leave some, uh, convince somebody to pick you over another entrepreneur, great piece of evidence. That other person is compromising their life to work with you. They are saying, I want to spend this part of my life working with you on your idea. That is a great indicator of your idea being interesting. If you can get somebody to leave another job or turn down a high paying job to work with you, awesome piece of evidence that you are interesting. So I've never funded a single person. I funded solo founders who built teams. So you can be a solo founder who has employees, that's fine. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, no, he was not a solo founder. Um, there are, Mark Pincus was a solo founder of Zenga. He had, Pincus was founder, then a bunch of employees. He hired senior level employees early on, but he was a solo founder. Um, but I don't know a single venture-backed business that could be built by one person. We have time for about two more. We have time for two more. I'll keep going, though. Um, you need to know somebody we know and they need to like you and tell you that, tell us that we should value you as a mentor. We have a 500 person mentor waiting list at this point that we ask people to show their value before we add them at this point. You know me, next. Up there, there was a question, yes. As a, as a consumer facing social mobile company, the number one thing I want to understand is how the fuck are you going to get people to use your product? Not 5,000 people, not 100,000 people, like a million. How in God's name are a million people ever going to know about you, care about you, or want to use your product? I don't believe that you can get there. Your barriers to convince me that I'm wrong. How do you convince me that I'm wrong? Get users or lay out an amazingly clear thesis that doesn't include, we're gonna spread by word of mouth or virally, because you're not. Like one out of a million will, which is cool, and they'll win, but you won't. Um, so you need to lay out the ways to cheat to get there. Cheating's fine. If you're building a marketplace, you better figure out how to cheat one side of it, otherwise you will not build your marketplace. So if you go take a look at all the really successful recent breakout companies, they all cheated. Pinterest cheated by engaging with mommy and family bloggers to get them and their audience deeply engaged early on, well before they were on the tech radar. Um, what was the other one? Um, Airbnb cheated. They leveraged Craigslist to get one side of their marketplace working before the other side worked. Figure out how to cheat your business. Um, product. If you're building something consumer facing and social, your design better be a differentiator. Your product better look, feel, and move and touch better than other people's product. That competency better be in-house. If you're outsourcing the core competency of your product, I don't believe your company is going to work. Why? Because your core competency is not internal. You are learning absolutely nothing from that core competency. So your differentiator needs to be internal. If you tell me my differentiator is, is design and usability and you're outsourcing that, that's not your differentiator. Your team needs to be like part of your differentiator. Um, 
Last thing in consumer stuff, you need to have a deep, 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 deep understanding and thesis of the big people in your space. Normally those big people involve Twitter, Facebook, you know, Tumblr, Foursquare, whatever. If you write them off as, ah, they're slow moving, oh, they're big, or oh, they don't make, wrong. Totally wrong, have respect. Be, be realistic, these are real companies, they're not dumb, they move really effectively, they can move quicker than you even if they're big because most of them are pretty agile. If they launch your product, I want to know how you are going to compete. And the answer is you probably can compete, but you need to lay out how. There's some things like they were like, our most common application at Techstars the first time through was basically companies that wanted to build four square lists. So it wasn't so, um, it was pretty obvious Foursquare was gonna build lists at some point. So when you ask all these companies, what happens if Foursquare builds lists, they'd look at you and be like, oh, but they're not, they, they haven't, why haven't they? I don't know, Foursquare's probably not gonna launch any new features. So you're probably right, you should build this. No, Foursquare launched lists and every one of those companies went out of business or shut down. So those are the three factors I would pay attention to. Who has the like, most amazing last question? No one? No. I have no fucking idea. I'll tell you in seven years. Honestly, I'm in a game where there is a five to 10 year period for things to succeed. Is Pinterest a success? I'm asking you a question. What? Right? Zero. Zero of my companies have went out of business. I'm an equity holder in 93 companies. Out of those 93, 23 are through Techstars. Two of those companies went out of business. The 70 angel investments that I'm in, none have went out of business. Anybody else? Come on. Anything? No? All right. Yeah. Um, your valuation for your company is what somebody offers you or what you will take. Those are the two barriers. Like, there is no way to put a value on an early stage company. The best way to do it is look at the team and say, oh, okay, how good is this team? Or look at the market and say, how big is this market? Those are the only two real metrics. Other than that, it's how much has somebody offered you or how much will you take to say yes to a deal? Um, there is no way to negotiate valuation other than to ask, which point the answer is probably no, or to get a competing valuation that forces me to reevaluate your company. Otherwise, you literally just have no leverage because there's nothing that makes me say like, oh, okay, I'll give you a million dollars more. Why would I? I have no reason to. Unless I desperately want in this deal and you say no, so that's bucket A, or B is somebody else comes along with a better offer and you're gonna take that and I want your deal. Now, if somebody, let's say you're raising money from me and I'm a professional investor and you say, ah, this guy on Wall Street just offered me a better term sheet, oh, have fun. Enjoy your guy on Wall Street. So it has to be somebody that I deem to be like probably respectable enough for me to go chase that term sheet that they offered you. Um, an average deal in New York, seed stage will raise at between a one and a half and a $5 million valuation. Um, that's on average to sell probably 20 to 30% of your company. So 20 to 30% of your company for um, one and a half to $5 million valuation. So that, that's how, I, on average, I've seen you know, upwards of $8 million, but those are founders with exits or teams that have super early traction or things like that. Uh, I've seen deals as low as a million bucks and you know, they raised 350 on a million dollar valuation. Um, that's cheap. I probably won't take that deal. I'd raise 250 at most if I'm gonna get a million dollar valuation and not give away you know, a third of my company. Um, you should be raising money for 12 to 18 months of runway. You should, your, your funding uh, in general should give you 12 to 18 months of runway. That guy left, we were having such a good rapport. Um, so, it sucks, I can't please everybody. Um, so 12 to 18 months is what you should look for. Um, Raising a half round, most professional investors don't want to do that. Why? Because you're going to need more money. 
So if you raise like 350, I don't tend to participate in rounds. I think like two of my deals I participate in around below $500,000. Why? Because I don't think you have enough runway to actually prove anything to get to a milestone to reach that next metric. The only deal I did below 500K was Skillshare which was able on 350 to get to the point of where they got to, which was awesome. Then they raised 2.5 uh, or something like that uh, pretty quickly. But I tend not to do anything small because I just don't think like putting money into a 100K deal, like so I buy three months of, like I'm not investing to pay for your life. That's the other thing to note. Like no investor is gonna pay for your life, your lifestyle, your salary. I'm not gonna pay for you to quit your job. That's not why I'm investing so that you can leave your current job. So you as an entrepreneur need to like, take the risk. You need to take the jump. You need to like, put yourself out there. Otherwise, why am I? I'm not giving you a permission slip here. Here's your permission slip to go start your company. That's silly. Now, if you're a veteran team with a family and like have some extenuating circumstances that like literally don't allow you to start a company before you have money, that's okay. But work nights and weekends, work your ass off, get your company to a point where it is fundable despite the fact that you are not full time and make it very clear that when we raise X amount of money, we will be full time and we will not be paying ourselves a exorbitant salary. What salary should a CEO or founders of a startup take? You should take a salary. I don't expect you not to take a salary. You should not necessarily be bleeding into all your savings. If you raise a 500K round and you take a salary, questionable. Um, your salary should be what sustains your lifestyle and your lifestyle should be reasonable. So if you have kids, it should be what literally allows you to pay for your kids and allows you to pay for your life. You shouldn't be living on the penthouse of a related building. That sucks. Not funding that. But I will fund you. Like, if you're a team of three college, recent college graduates, like, move in together. Show me the hustle. Get to the point of, like, minimal viable salary. Um, that's where I would end up. You should not be saving money from your salary at a startup. That is a wrong, wrong salary. You should not want to do that, why? You should want to allocate that money to hire other people. At an early stage technology company, what am I funding? Realistically, I'm funding one or two things. People, hiring more people, adding more people, like paying for people, or operations. If your company has some significant operations costs, like you know, there's hosting, it's probably operations should be 20% of your costs people should be 80% of your costs at an early stage. And that's a reasonable like breakdown. Now, some things skew higher if you need like heavy data centers or things like that or some special tech. Um, if you need to do licensing or anything like that, there's like extenuating different businesses. But 80-20 is probably what I would expect from a company. Yes, Two I cheated. How many months do you think a entrepreneur should expect to be out there raising money? And yeah. what percentage of their time will that take? So, you're either raising money or you're not. There's no, I'm thinking about raising money. There's no, yeah, we're exploring raising money. You are raising money or you are not raising money. As an entrepreneur, you're doing one of those two things. A lot of the times as an entrepreneur, you are always theoretically raising money. After you raise your Series A, you should be building relationships that get you to your Series B. Doesn't mean you're actively out there raising it, but every time you have an ability to start that dot, start it. Um, you're on the clock once you're raising money. Three months is the sort of normal clock. Six months, you're old and stale. If you don't raise money within six months of being in the market, everybody in the city knows you. We all talk. We all know who's been out there. At Techstars last year, we took two companies who had been on the market for about a year trying to raise money. They didn't raise money, and we still took them into our program. And we took them knowing that. Why did we do that? Because we thought in three months, we could help them take an enormous step up in order to restart that fundraising process. If we, our barrier for them succeeding was much higher because of that factor. And so we needed to see much more growth in that company during our program in order to really believe they could raise money. One of them ended up taking that huge leap and raised a much bigger round than he had originally set out for. The other company took a good leap and ended up raising money from people who were flirting with him for the past year, and they ended up getting over the barrier. So we felt good about that, but that's a huge factor for us, is is this company stale? Is this company been seen and passed on by everybody? If so, you literally as a company need to take an enormous leap up to start that again. Otherwise, you're just stale. 
Look, it's a, raising money is a pain in the ass. You should not enjoy it. If you enjoy raising money as an entrepreneur, you're doing the wrong thing. You should be in finance. Um, it sucks. It's brutal. It's, it takes you away from your product and your company. That's what you should want to be doing is working on your product and company. Um, it's not a full-time job, but it's way up there. It's a huge, 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 huge time suck. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no VC is going to fund a non-for-profit. So if you're doing social entrepreneurship for profit, that's cool. But if it's not for profit, VC is not the right answer. Um, this, is a, this is sort of an answer to your first one. Um, you get absolutely no points for difficulty. So like the figure skating or gymnastics in the Olympics, where there's like a score for difficulty and then you're judged based upon that difficulty score, you don't get points for difficulty in this industry. Because anything super difficult, I need to see more evidence that you're able to do it. So it is much harder to disrupt a really firm fundamental industry. Just because you're going for the billion or six billion dollar company doesn't mean I'm going to take a bigger risk on you. I actually need to see you de-risk that business a little more. So if you're trying to disrupt something that's really, really, really hard to disrupt, you need to do more work to disrupt it. Your job as an entrepreneur before raising money is to do everything you can to de-risk your business as best as you can. De-risk everything. If somebody says team is an issue and you keep hearing that, de-risk the team. Build a better team. If somebody keeps saying, I don't know how you're going to do sales. I don't know how you're going to scale the tech. Figure out how to answer those really, really important things about your business and de-risk them because that's going to get somebody over the hump. So if there's something that you just keep hearing, man, I don't know how big this market is. De-risk that. Go out and solve that one concern because then you're going to be able to answer that one concern. So if you're trying to disrupt something, figure out how to get to the point of actually being able to disrupt that market. How do you do that? Understand the market better than everybody else. Joe Cohen at CourseKit is trying to disrupt the learning management system market, Blackboard. Trying to kill Blackboard. He is doing that via a different thesis. You can disrupt via a couple ways. One is product. Two is business execution. Three is a different thesis on the industry. If it's business execution, you better have a deep understanding of that industry and deep knowledge and deep connections. If it's product, you better have an amazingly better product. If it's thesis, you are literally taking a different approach than everybody else in your market. So Joe at CourseKit, instead of going to admins at schools and trying to sell in there, he is saying, I'm going to go to the students. I'm going to do this social. My entire, entire distribution of my learning management system is social and I'm going to give it all away for free. That's a thesis-driven disruption. That's interesting. If Joe said, I'm just going to go outsell Blackboard, he, the kid's 20. He's a team of 20-year-olds. I don't think he can outsell the suits that are going to walk in and work with IT people at schools. And so you need to find that. Is this the, back to product founder fit, is this the team that can disrupt this market in that way? That, to me, is interesting. 20-year-olds disrupting learning management via social and, and via product, I'll buy that. That's the right team to try to disrupt it. Last question. Two more. You and then you. No. I don't, to get into our program, you don't need to be incorporated. You don't need to do anything. You can be three guys hacking in your basement or two girls with an idea. I don't care. We'll help you do that. Um, one of the other questions is whether any of your founders have another commitment but the No. Um, I invest in people who are doing this full time. I, if you're not working on your startup full time, why, why am I going to give you my money? That's like a huge waste of my money because you're not committing to my money full time. So it's just, my program's a full-time program. I expect everybody to be there full-time and commit full-time. So side projects aren't welcome, like finishing your old job or coming nights and weekends. That's not what I'm looking for. Uh, no. No. I, like, I fund people who are full-time doing their company. I don't think you can start a company without doing it full time. You can bootstrap in nights and weekends and get a product going or get something off the ground. You can do it as a company, but why would I fund you to not do something that you're going to commit? Literally, I expect you not only to be full time, but literally never to sleep, 
never to talk to your kids, and never to eat. I do. Why? Because if you don't do that, somebody else is, and they're going to beat you because they're outworking you. And so I want to fund the guy who's going to outwork you every time. So I want people, like I go into General Assembly on weekends, and I look around at who's there, and those are the companies I want to fund. If you're not there on the weekend at General Assembly, I think you're lazy. And so that's my metric for judging you, is are you going to work weekends? You don't need to work every weekend. You don't need to work every day. But literally, I want to see you literally exhausted because you were working so hard. Because doing a startup is fucking really hard. And if you're not going to put in that effort to overcome the fact that it's really, 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 really hard to succeed, you're not going to win. Somebody else is going to crush you because they outworked you. Last question. Um, probably advantageous. Um, so we take companies, so is it, is it cool to apply multiple times? Yeah, so Wantworthy, which was in our program last time, that was their third time applying to Techstars. Uh, Ambassador, which was in our program last time, that was their fifth time applying to Techstars. Uh, Igniter, which is a breakout company out of Techstars, applied three times before they got in. Daily Burn, which sold their company to IEC, applied three times before they got in. Why? You're showing me progress. If, if you keep applying and every time you apply, you've made real progress and real momentum on your startup, I see that line forming. If you apply six times and it's the same bullshit pitch, the same place you're at, and you haven't quit your job and done anything, yeah, it's not great. Um, but if you're making progress app to app, like that's awesome. That's a great, great, great indicator. And I swear to God, I remember every single app I've ever reviewed. I do. That's my, like, my, my job. That's my skill. I need to do that. So every single time, someone, I read every single app in Techstars, personally. If you have applied to Techstars, I personally reviewed your app. If you get into my program, I personally made that choice. If you don't get in, I personally cut you. Why? Because it's my job. My only responsibility is to pick companies that we fund and letting somebody else review those apps. I'm outsourcing the only thing that's important. We had 1,500 companies apply. I read every single one of them. Um, and I will remember next year, if we get more, all 1,500 of those and where they've moved. So apply multiple times, keep going, make progress. Thank you guys so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed it.